how would you describe the new album, Fighter Fall? Yeah, so the new album, um, Fight or Fall, how would I describe it? Look, the album has taken um, three to four years of work. How would I describe it? I think it's a very powerful album. I think it's straight to the point. Um, we love aggressive heavy metal. And so even though we're a power metal band, we've stayed away from the, the kind of cliched, happy, sing-along kind of – we actually do have a sing-along chorus. I'm contradicting myself, but – Largely, the album is is very powerful and heavy and dark, uh, which is what we love. So, in, in short, powerful, heavy, and dark, I'd say. And obviously, listeners, they already got a little bit of taste of the album with the first single, The Hounds of Basketball. Um, Michael Pond, he plays bass on that. So, how did that come about? Yeah, so Mike's been a, a friend of mine for quite some time now. He plays bass in my American band, Death Dealer. Um, which is a band with also featuring Ross the Boss from uh, X Man of War. So we're in that band together. And when I was doing this album, I thought, you know what, it'd be great to have Mike play on on a song because the guy's such a beast. And um, yeah, that's how that came about. I just called a friend a favor, and and uh, he came forward and and smashed it. Awesome. And I just wanted to talk about the bass first. First of all, like the production overall, because there's a high emphasis on the bass on this album and i think that's really great because you know there are some bands out there that like to hinder the bass for some reason so like i didn't really i wasn't really aware of the importance of bass players until like my second or third year of college when i got into music so it's just yeah so i really appreciate that there are some bands out there that really like to give the bass players some a chance to shine in Elf. Yeah, thank you for noticing. Um, the first thing to to call out a, a shout out to is our, uh, I guess, engineer, uh, a guy called Chris Thamelka, who lives in Melbourne, Australia, runs a studio down there. He's really the secret source of this album. Um, he's brought it alive, and we we did want an emphasis on on the bass because let's face it, you know, I think over the last. 10 to 15 years, this loudness war with bands has occurred where everything has to be super loud. And we've taken a little bit of a, I guess, an Iron Maiden approach where we've just wanted to make it a little bit breathing and organic in parts, um, but still heavy in your face and current. So what we decided to do was to really emphasis, have a big emphasis on the bass and the bottom end. Um, I think bands do put a lot of bottom end in their guitars and, and, and that sucks up a lot of the bass guitar that you don't hear in heavy metal. So um, we've tried to go a slightly different route and because we, you know, we've got such a great bass player in Glenn, uh, he locks in perfectly with not only the drums, but also the guitars. And then you've, you've, you've really got this heartbeat that maybe some other bands don't get in their production. So um, I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah. And I think you brought up a good point. Um, in recent years, there's definitely been an issue with mixing albums these days and how it's kind of like, like you said, it's a contest to see who can be the loudest when in actuality, it doesn't have to be so loud as long as you can have like a big sound, but not have it be like damaging to your ears, if that makes sense. Yeah. And part of the, the challenge too, is when you turn an album up. There's there's a thing that I call caramelization. You, the louder you turn it up, the better you want it to feel, and um, that is a real challenge. I don't know if you're familiar with a band called Airborne. They're like an ACDC kind of thing. Airborne have that. But at low volume, they sound cool, but you crank that up, and it, that's a really unique thing. It's also something that we loved about '80s albums, right? So, you know, the the classic Four Thrash. You know that that era of '86 to 1990. There was a real organic nature to the production that when you cranked it, it had a slightly different character. So that's what we've gone for with this album uh, is, is to make it more enjoyable the louder you make it instead of um, simply just, you know, it's a louder version of what you've been hearing. There should be something slightly different that you hear at different, uh, different volumes. That's what we're hoping for anyway. And you produced Firefalls and the previous album, is that right? 
Yeah, so <laughs> I guess the role of producer um, is is a, a number of things. For me, I've been producing all my own albums, my Empires of Eden stuff that I did, which is a, a four four solo albums I released with um, some singers like Udo Dirk Schneider, Ralph Cheapers. Then um, I produced the Death Dealer material, and the idea really in production is the formation of the songs, pulling all the songs together, working with the guys, trying to step outside of myself as in this band and make things better from a performance perspective and also too from a, uh, a sonic perspective. So working with Chris on um, giving him references of where we need to be, you know, sonically, but also hearing what he comes up with and helping him tweak. So um, it's incredibly easy to produce this band and Death Dealer because I'm working with such talented guys that you just let them go, you know what I mean? whereas other producers can really enforce their will. So, yeah, uh, I've been in the producer's seat for the last couple, and I really enjoyed doing it. And speaking of talented guys, you have Clay T on drums and your new singer, forgive me if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, yeah. Louis Gorgievsky? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, okay. we're very lucky to have Louis. Um, you know, you mentioned Clay. Clay... One of the reasons that I formed Night Legion six or seven years ago was purely as a band of my best friends. Okay, so um, I was off the road with Death Dealer. I formed the band, and I, I kind of cherry-picked my best mates <laughs> to be in a band so we could go and make music together. And Clay, D and I go back almost 30 years um, playing in bands together. So does Cole, the other guitar player. It's the same. Um but you're yeah, very fortunate to have Louis. Louis sang on my old uh, solo albums, you know, 12 years ago, and we've been friends ever since that experience. Um, and it's just worked out great. The guy is an incredible talent, has an incredible range. You can hear it on the songs. Uh, and I think what Louis brings is a real fresh vocal perspective that, you know, when people hear this for the first time, I hope they hear that. that uh, I guess, uniqueness in what we're trying to do. Because let's face it, it's all been done before, right? Heavy metal. What, what are you, you, who's reinventing a wheel? Um, really, you know, there's a couple of bands that are doing that. Our thing is to wear our influences on our sleeve, have a great time doing it, but but also to bring in a fresh Australian approach to, to the sound. Yeah. And I'll never forget when I first heard that, um, when I first heard the single, The Hounds of Basketball, I heard Louis' voice, and for a second, I thought it was Bruce Dickinson. So, like, it's modern, but in a way, it kind of has, like, a retro vibe with Louis' voice. Actually, secretly, it is Bruce Dickinson. No, it's, um, <laughs> he gets a lot of comparisons uh, to Bruce, and I, and I think that's fair. Uh, I think he's he's got a real timber that, that is reminiscent of Bruce. He's a huge Maiden fan. I think that's his band, you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, he he can also bring some you know DOS kind of darkness to things and and a little bit more of an aggressive rasp. Um, but yeah, great lyricist, great guy, and uh, we're very lucky to have him. I think you can hear a little bit Black Sabbath with the bass with the distorted bass tones. You can hear what? I'm sorry. Black Sabbath. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, oh look, anytime you can say anything sounds like Black Sabbath, it's like the greatest compliment, right? Um, you know, the geezer butler side of things, you know, let's face it, um, Sabbath, Sabbath are really, for me, they're, they're beyond a band. You know, they're uh, a form of religion, I guess, you know, when you listen back. And I, the cool thing about Sabbath too is the different phases. You've got the Aussie phase, the Dio phase, you know, um, and then the Jeff Jeff Martin stuff. Uh, sorry, I'm... Um, Gotten his name, um, Tony Martin. Give me uh, stuff. So yeah, lots of influences there from from Sabbath. I think we've got a track called um, "Hand of Death" that is very Candle Mass, very Sabbath. Um, like the last track on the album. So yeah, I think that's that's. I'm glad you brought up the Hands of Death because it's it's slower and more moody. That's a, I feel like that was a great way to close the album. Yeah, thank you. It's, it, personally, it's my favorite song on the album. 
Um, and I, I want to make a point too. We only went with nine tracks. So we went to the label. We had 15 songs. And I'm a fan of Sabbath, Maiden, Priest, Old School, Eddie stuff. That's kind of where I, my head lives. They were eight or nine track albums. That was it. That's what you got. And I've always been a fan of that format. Um, I find really a band's best song is their 13th on the album. You know what I'm trying to say? So we went with a nine song album to make it short. Um, we had a contractual timeline with Massacre. And I, I said, we're going to fall short of that, you know, but I, I could give you another song. It's good. But is it as good as the other nine that we've really chosen and taken our time to go through? And, they were completely supportive and, and agreed. They said their favorite stuff was eight tracks, nine tracks of the best. You know, you go through, you, I don't want to waste your time as a listener, Lana, you know. So um, my job is to put the best material on that album and make it a, a really enjoyable experience from start to finish instead of hitting track 13 going, yeah, well, I got stuff to do now. So, um, yeah, that, and I think Hand of Death's a cool closer because it, it's still a great song, but it's it's not your typical Halloween-esque power metal, you know what I mean? So let's get dark with it. That's what we did. You also brought up a good point. How I noticed that these days, artists tend to like real, especially with CDs, they tend to really fill up the CD with as much material as possible, and it's... Fortunately, I don't see. I don't think that's going to go away. But it is really tiring because you're because how much quality are in all of those songs? I don't want to like poke fun at some artists, but I feel like that's the case sometimes. Like you're trying to get as much terror out there as possible, but really, how much how much can listeners take? Of course, and uh, let's face it, people are listening differently. To, to music now, like, um, you know, here's, here's our vinyl, right? So, you know, most people that buy vinyl are going to sit down and listen to the whole thing, okay? Um, same thing with the CD. You know, maybe they'll sit in the car and listen to it. But New Day Dawning, Spotify, I'm a big fan. Um, you go to Spotify, you add a couple of songs to your playlist, and that's what you're doing. You know, now we would we would beg people to please listen to it from start to finish because we've we've crafted the album in a certain way that we want to have that wonderful experience of enjoying it. Um, but I'm also mindful, you know, pick your favorite songs, put it in your playlist, and um, I don't want people to sit down and sit through anything that isn't perfect. Uh, and it's it's hard to cull songs off an album when you've put a lot of time into it. But we have to, like, again, from a producer's perspective. It's got to be song first. It's got to be the best it can possibly be. And, um, you know, who knows? The, we might be able to rework some of this other stuff for future material. There's no, no, we never waste anything, you know, it gets used in some way. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, we're really proud of it. I was just going to say, you could possibly rework the material for another Nightwagen album. Absolutely. And, you know, it's kind of cool with the people I work with. I've got songs that I wrote 10 years ago that may not have been appropriate for Death Dealer, but I'll bring it back up to Louis now and he'll resurrect it into something incredible. And so there's a whole, I've kind of got my own little song farm on my computer of, you know, probably a hundred ideas, a um, whole bunch of songs. I was just talking to Ripper Owens recently about writing for him. Um, so much material that, when it goes into the hands of someone fresh, they can revive it. Um, and you know, an example of that is the very first Death Dealer album was called War Master, and the War Master song was something I was going to bin. I was going to throw it in the bin, and I played it to Sean, uh, Sean Peck, our singer, and he's like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Let's do it. Ended up turning into a full song, and we played it live ever since. And So, yeah, it's good to have um, ideas. Don't bin them completely <laughs> but uh yeah we can rework stuff it's just about getting the right singer or the right scenario yeah it's also in the eye of, um the, um depends on the listener because like you just said song that that maybe isn't as good or 
possibly deserves to go into bed, it could be different for someone else. Like you said, oh, Sean. Completely. Yeah, and everyone in the band's got a different favorite song on the album. Like I think um, Cole, our guitar player, our other guitar player, his favorite track was "Babylon Burns." I'm like, really? I didn't really hear that as a, like a favorite, you know, for him. And uh, so it's it's cool. You've got to sometimes surrender. Well, you do have to surrender your opinion to others. You can't, you can't just have a view. You've got to open it up. So that's what makes great music. Yeah. So he. Talk a little bit more about your songwriting process. Like, is it the riffs first or is it the lyrics? Yeah, for me, for me, it's riffs first because I don't sing. Uh, I, I, I have a kind of a policy about every singer writes their own lyrics and melodies because they're the guys or girls that are selling the story. You know, I want it personal, you know. Um, so for me, it's riffs first. But I do... When a riff comes around, as you can see behind me, like we're in my studio at the moment, it's a great environment to write in. And if I'm inspired, I will come up with a fairly large concept fairly quickly. So I'll write a riff, but I'll kind of hear where it's going, where I, what I want it to be, um, tempo, drums, bass, and then I'm mindful of who I'm writing for. That's the next thing. Um, who am I writing for? Uh, I wrote a song for Udo, Dirk Schneider. It was on a solo CD. So what do I want to hear Udo do? And then he connected with it, thankfully, and that worked out really well. So my job is to write music that so singers connect with. Uh, when I write for Louis, I, I write specifically for Louis. When I write for Sean, Sean Peck, I write for Sean. Um, and I, I wrote a couple of tracks in mind for Ripper as well. So whether they resonate or not, you can't predict. But um, so far it's been pretty successful. The guys seem to dig it. And also, too, I give a title for a song, like as I write a lot of demos, they're not called Demo 1, Demo 2. I'll call it, you know, Architect of Hope or, um, you know, like The Hounds of the Baskerville. You know, I came up with that. It's like... And straight away they resonate with that title and then the lyrics come and it's it's a good thing. So that's that's usually the process. Oh, I see. And you held up the album cover for Fight of Fall not too long ago. And I say there's definitely I see a little similarities from that and the debut album cover, obviously because of the werewolf sense it was done by the same artist, but was that intentional? It was. Um the first album I've got it here. Plastic, I don't know if you can see it. The the first album, uh, what people don't know is the wolves are actually the band. If you look closely, you can see my tattoos on one of the wolves, um, which we didn't really say at the time. But, yeah, we've used Dusan Markovic to do both, both pieces of art. Um, when I threw to the band what do you want to do for, for – the second album that were like we really want to continue on with the, with the wolves name um i guess the the name night legion tends to speak to that imagery and speak to a lot of things but certainly um blood thirsty wolves works pretty well from a heavy metal perspective so uh but yeah dusan uh did this killer artwork for us it turned out good i think this um this is the red vinyl. Yeah, this is the red vinyl. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Uh, Massacre has done a fantastic job, I think. Um, and it's got cool, cool liner, liner notes as well. But we got cool stuff inside and some photos. Um, but yeah, answering your question, we did want to continue on with that. I don't know that we're going to do that for album three uh, when we do that, but certainly for album two. Yeah, that was going to be my next question about if you were going to continue on with the werewolves. Because, like, you could have, I mean, but for now, it looks really cool. I think I think that was a really clever idea. For us, it made sense. You know, I think it's it's also the wolves. The wolves have been done. If you look at a million metal covers, you'll find wolves on them, right? Um, but it seemed to make sense for us. And I've got to be fair, too. This might be the first time people have heard us. All right, so it's been a long time since we've released an album. I think it's five years. 
Um, you know, and so it's an imagery that's important to us. Let's put it out on, on this album as well. It made sense. So, yeah. And speaking of the imagery, I think it's really, I think it's really great that um, our, like Night Legion and Arkansas and all the bands that you've been in, you put so much time into your album covers because I feel like these days there are certain, there are some acts that are like really slacking on the quality of the album covers. I mean, because back in the old days, well, before we had Spotify, streaming services, YouTube. All we had to rely on was, hey, this album cover looks cool and stuff like that. So I think it's, I think it's good that there are bands out there that still take the time to make sure that album cover looks really good. I I agree. I'm actually frustrated myself as a metal fan when I look at covers that are just lazy. But that's the thing, right? Why should you buy this? Like, why should anybody buy this? Right, it's cool out. Like, okay, the music's great. You can get it for free on Spotify. Let's not let's not bullshit people. Um, I think you should buy it because it's got cool art. It's when you're listening to it, you can spend time picking through the liner notes. The booklet looks great. We put a lot of time into the booklet. You know, um, it's a cool product, and you know, the artwork is part of it. Why did we buy Number of the Beast? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, why did we Why did we buy? You know. Um, half the albums we have, a lot of it's because of the cool artwork, and we love the band, of course. But you got to have the good artwork, and um, it's my job to make sure that our product provides everything to metal fans that that I want to see. You know, I'm a vinyl collector, so let's do different formats. Let's do red vinyl. Let's do cool stuff. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So, do you have a Particular favorite song on the album? Uh, favorite song, did you say? Yeah, favorite song. Yeah. Look, I think um, my favorite song, as I'm looking at it, it's probably, probably Hand of Death. Um, I just love its darkness. It's, it's, I think it's unusual in a, in a writing perspective because the chorus is super slow. Normally in metal, it's cookie cutter. Um, Mid-tempo verse, half-time pre-chorus, double-time chorus. Like, that's rinse and repeat power metal. We've just gone the opposite way with this album um, and made sure that we're making something that's interesting for us. So, Hand of Death, I really dig Hounds of Baskerville uh, because of Mike LaPone's bass playing. I think he's just taken it to a new, the song to a new level. And, um, yeah, but... I'm really, really proud of all the songs for different reasons. Um, you know, uh, uh, where are we? The Enemy, uh, track eight, was written by Cole, our guitar player. So that was really cool to have his flavor come in. So that changes things up a bit. He's a big Avenged Sevenfold fan. So taking some of his influences, but still making it dark and metal and power. You know, let's face it, it's a power metal album. Um, but yeah, that answers your question, I hope. Oh, and you brought the enemy. That's actually my favorite song on the album. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it was as soon as he brought it in, it it had some almost pop elements to it. You know, it's super catchy. Um, but that's the beauty of you know having someone like Louis. He can he can still direct it towards a darker metal tone. So I think it works really well on the album. Yeah, we're really happy with it. We we really did spend a lot of time, probably six months, really critiquing the order, uh, starts and finishes of songs. You know, when it's not a lazy album. There's no um, lazy endings. You know, we really put a lot of time into it. Um, my guitar work on this, I, I spent probably eight to 12 months on solos, drafting them normally with lead breaks. I'll come in and just kind of do my thing just go for it this stream of consciousness whereas this album i've sat down crafted all of the solos as pieces so i've written all the parts out this album so it's a completely different approach and i'm, I'm just super proud of it and i can't wait for it to come out on june 30. do you would you consider performing these songs live 
Yeah, we we have. We have already played with Udo Dirk Schneider in Sydney uh, a few weeks ago. So we got out and um, did, I think, four songs from the new album, which was pretty uh, exhilarating to do. And uh, we've got some other plans for Australian touring. We're talking to some overseas promoters at the moment uh, about bringing the band uh, hopefully to the States uh, and hopefully to Europe. Um, there's even a chance with Death Dealer touring next year that uh, Night Legion might get on that bill as well. So super keen. We are going to be releasing a video of the Udo show uh, with the song um, uh, Babylon Burns. So. We performed that live and we've cut a live video clip to the album track. So that is coming out so people can see what the band looks like live, how, you know, what our show's like. And, um, you know, because we're in Australia, it's kind of frustrating. We'd love to be in the States today um, touring and playing. It's just getting everything happening. So it's hard enough for American bands to go on to, let alone an Australian band to come on in, you know what I mean? So but we're pumped. We're, we're doing everything we can to make it happen. The live video for Babylon Burns. Where can where can we find it? Excellent. At the, it has not yet been released. Um, so we've released a video for Hounds, which you've seen. Um, by the time this video comes out, we will have released the second single called Soaring Into the Black, which is a, a, a lyric clip as well. But on the day that we release the album, on June 30, we're going to release the live clip of... Um, uh, <laughs> Babylon Burns. So, um, yeah. Awesome. So, we get, so the video will come out the same day as the album. Absolutely. Yep. Oh, perfect. And bef- just before we go, I'd like to ask if there was one band you could tour with, who would it be and why? One band we could tour with. Um... That's a really good question. Look, I think it would have to be Maiden. <laughs> um, look, let's face it, supporting Maiden, I think it's Bruce's son's band, The Raven Age, is supporting Maiden on their world tour at the moment, and they're, they're a great band. Um, it's a double-edged sword, right? I've I've supported Megadeth, Nightwish. Um, I've, I've done a bunch of touring overseas. Um, it's a double-edged sword. It's great to play with these guys. You were talking about it being like a double-edged sword? Yeah, like you, you go out with the biggest and the best bands. It's great, but they also you, you're also tested, right? So um, you've got to be up to the challenge. You can't go out half assed And uh, I love that, that aspect of playing with, with you know, um, the biggest and the best wherever we possibly can. Yeah, maybe you can get if. You were to tour with Maiden, maybe you can get um, Bruce and Louie to sing together and see if the audience can tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I think Louis would, would lose his mind if that was the case. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, these are all um, things we'd love to do. I think every band would love to do that kind of stuff, and um, we'll just keep doing our thing. Uh, awesome. And... So I want to thank you, Stu, for taking your time out of your day for this interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lana. And to people watching or anyone listening, um, you know, Night Legion is on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Uh, drop by, say hello. We always say good day to everybody. We've got pre-order links. If you really want to support, uh, you can get it uh, delivered globally through Nuclear Blast and um, our Australian uh, friends can get it through JB Hi-Fi out here. The red vinyl is available. Uh, it looks stunning. So, um, yeah, we appreciate the support. We believe you won't be disappointed, and we're looking forward to June 30. album looks better in person than it does through a screen. Thank you, mate. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. Have a, enjoy the rest of your day. All right, mate. Thanks very much for your time. Take care.